Hey guys, it's Q&A Tuesday. I'm going to start off with a quick answer to a question that comes up very, very often from clients that visit our website. And this question is from Christopher Peterson. Uh, great Q&A today, or yesterday actually. You're so right, I would take the AP over the RM, the AP is stealth rich. I went to Copenhagen, Denmark Monday, and the AD told me if someone came in with a Rolex, they would send it to Rolex to have them test the steel 904L, because even when open the watch, it could be difficult to see if the movement was fake or not. Do you think that's true? I find it hard to believe. I mean, sure, I've seen AAA copies of GMT Masters that look 99% real and way within a gram. The class was smooth. Only thing they gave it off was the laser engraved crown was too visible. Second question, do you sell to Denmark? If so, will you send to a European location? So the packeting is sent from a European location and we don't get hit with an extra tax or VAT. In terms of the fakes, and this is, I, and I discussed this on an episode, uh, there are some really good fakes out there. I do find it hard to believe that a retailer is gonna send that watch to Rolex to get it checked out. First of all, anybody coming into a store and selling their Rolex, the minute I'm, you tell them, oh, you know what, no problem, I wanna buy it, but I'm gonna send it to Rolex first and get it checked, will tell you out of your mind whether the watch is real or fake. That's number one. Number two, if you're a dealer, and if you're especially a Rolex dealer, and if you can't tell that the Rolex is actually fake, no matter how triple A, B, C, or whatever the markings are on fake watches are, if you can't tell if that watch is real or not, then honestly, shame on you. You should be able to tell a fake from a real Rolex if you're in this business. Next question, in terms of shipping to the European Union, no, we do not have a European Union office. If we did, then yes, I would ship to Denmark, and you would save the 19 or 20% VAT that you guys unfortunately stuck with paying. And every other day I do get an inquiry on our website saying, hey, can you ship this watch as a gift? Can you ship it a certain way so I don't get hit with the taxes? And my answer has always been the same from the very beginning. No, sorry, I cannot. And the reason for that is because it would be illegal on my part to do that. I would basically be falsifying documents. I don't want this to come back and bite me in the ass, obviously. Nor do I want to put a customer in any sort of predicament. I actually had an issue where customers send the watch in. He was a customer from Europe that bought the watch locally. And uh, then he went back to Europe and then he said, oh, wait a minute, my watch isn't working. Something's wrong with it. I said, no problem. Send it back to me. He sent it in for repair. I sent it back as a repair. And the issues he had with customs actually trying to prove that he, watched the, he bought the watch while he was here. And then it became really a pain in the butt for him because they asked him, well, how did you bring the watch into the country? So it was like a whole ordeal. It was really no skin off my back. He, he was the one that actually had more issues. So now, unfortunately, we cannot do that. You could come here and buy the watch. You could meet me at a duty-free zone, such as Hong Kong, where I'm at a trade show and buy it there. When I ship to places that have taxes, such as Denmark or any country in the European Union, we do declare the full value and you have to pay the VAT. But we still do sell a fair share to Europe because sometimes we have deals that are good enough to where even if you pay the taxes, it still works out well. Next question is from Zooks. One, hey Roman, as always, love your videos. Thank you. Thanks for that and thanks for answering my question in your previous videos. Hope that you can answer a few more. Heard from an AD that Rolex is increasing the supply of stainless steel sports watches. Is it true? How do you think it will affect the current gray market prices? Two, what do you think of the AP Royal Oak 15500 SD trading over list right now? Do you think that if I were to pick one up at the current gray market price, would it hold its current value? Whoever told you that Rolex is increasing supply of Rolex is lying to you. Oh, yeah because nobody out there, unless you're in a specific department at Rolex and the top secret knows what the production numbers are going to be. If somebody's out there telling you that they're increasing or decreasing or they're making so many and they're making that many, it's all a bunch of bull, it's hype, probably told to you by a dealer or somebody that was biased to sell you something else versus a Rolex at a current market price. Nobody knows how many pieces they're gonna make. I don't know it, I don't have a glass ball, they don't know it, but odds are by the way things are going, they would be stupid to increase production because the hype right now is so crazy about the brand. They're getting so much brand recognition out of this whole stainless steel Rolex hype. I wouldn't be surprised that they're gonna decrease production any further, but again, I don't know. In regards to the new 15500 SD, uh, of course, there's going to be trading over this. Right now, the hype over stainless steel uh, Royal Oaks, especially the plain ones, is so high. The 15400s, the older 15300s, all went up in value. So naturally, the newer ones are going to be trading over this, and there's going to be a huge shortage of them. If you walk into an AP boutique today and you say, hey, I want a Royal Oak, Chrono, or a plain one, they're going to ask you, well, what have you bought from us before? 
or let me sell you this particular royal oak, but you also have to buy a ladies piece alongside with it. If you want to buy this, you got to buy this. If you want to buy the hot pieces, you got to buy the regular goods as well. So we have some sort of history with you. As far as it's holding its current value, I've told you guys before, uh, I don't have a glass ball. And I always say the watches are not an investment. They're just an expensive toy. So if you like the 15500 go out there and buy it. Whether or not it's going to continue holding its value by the way the market is going today, it's seemingly so, but nobody really knows what's going to happen five years from now. I was always a fan of going back. If you're going to buy something that's, so, that's deemed to be collectible by the general audience, like the stainless steel Royal Oak, go back. I went all the way back. I have the very first Royal Oak stainless steel. You guys have seen it many times. Uh, if you don't want to spend that kind of money, go back to a 15300 today. I feel like that's going to be a better bet. And the next question is sort of uh, in the same realm. This one comes from James Robertson. Hey, Roman, great videos, new subscriber. Thank you. I wanted to ask you a question. I have a Rolex Batman box and papers debating on trading up due to the hype of the Batman. I am a huge AP fan like you, and I'm looking at the offshore white dial Navy Chrono or a Rolex Zenith Daytona gold white dial on a strap A serial. I feel that you're right on the gold Zenith Daytona's upwards trends. I do have an 18 karat rose gold glitch with the Senator Chrono. What's your opinion on AP holding value versus Daytona? Here's the thing. I actually would tell you to go sell your Batman GMT. If you bought your Batman back in the day and you could probably almost double your money today, take that money and put it into a higher end piece. And AP is a higher end piece or a Daytona would be a higher end piece. And I do agree with you on Zenith Daytona's. They're on the upwards trends. It's because they're getting older. You know what I mean? 2000 was almost 20 years ago. Now, us 40-something guys still, you know, there's a good old cliche meme on the internet that says, you know, I still think 1999 was five years ago. Well, it's been 20 years. So, yes, going older is better. It's more, it becomes more collectible, less of the pieces of them are out there. If you can find a nice A-serial Zenith Daytona with papers, I would certainly tell you to go that route. As far as AP holding value versus the tono, you're trading towards it, but you have to remember something. You're trading something hot for something hot. But the Navy officers today, if you, especially if you're talking about the older one, you know, you can pick those up in the mid-teens. So technically, you should be able to take your Batman and trade it for a watch that retails for $26,000. And I think that's a good deal because personally, I feel AP is sort of that higher echelon brand versus Rolex, even though Rolex is number one in terms of sales, obviously. So it's a bit of a tough decision to make. Do you go from Rolex to Rolex to an older Rolex that is more collectible, that's somewhat on the upward trend? I do see this upward trend again. I'm putting away a bunch of Zenith Daytonas myself, whether the yellow gold or white gold. I would put it in what I call a lock box. <laughs> a Zenith Daytona with papers, you know, 27, 28, $30,000 today, and now you've got st brand new stainless steel Daytonas trading in the low 20s. Uh, the choice is obvious to me. And it's only a matter of time. Go back and look at the gold pole Newman they told you this. They're trading at outrageous numbers right now. So if you plan on holding something long term, probably that would be the better bet if I had to choose. Hope that helps and thanks for subscribing. Here's a great one from Shia. Hi Roman, thank you for the great content. As always, I love APs, but this paddock video was amazing. I think you're referring to that $600,000 diamond encrusted paddock that I put up there. Um, just wanted to get your feeling on the hype around Tiffany stem dials on paddocks. I've seen a Nautilus 5726 Tiffany go around $150,000. Without that little stamp, they sell for much less. Are you a fan of the limited editions? Do you think it's a bubble within a bubble? I actually love that question. Uh, Tiffany stamp paddocks historically have sold for approximately 30 to 40 percent more than a regular paddock, but not all. It still has to be on a popular model. There's some Tiffany stamp uh, paddocks out there, some of the older annual calendars and things of that nature. They don't really bring buku bucks because nobody cares for the watch. It's small, it's not in style, and so on and so forth. The Nautiluses, however, are through the roof because they are Nautiluses, and that's the hottest thing right now. So uh, it's not a bubble within a bubble. It's a combination of things. It's a combination of the consumer and dealers like us, secondary dealers. We're the ones that are hyping up Tiffany stamped paddocks out there. We're the ones that are paying more money for Tiffany stamped paddocks simply because we're saying, hey, they made a lot less of them. Therefore, they're a lot rarer. Paddock hasn't often put other companies' names onto their dial because they're Paddock, right? But Tiffany is one of those companies that they chose to do this with and they still do. The day they put the name Luxury Bazaar on a Paddock, which will never happen, that, that Paddock will still be worth a lot more money. And the reason for that is, again, it's supply and demand. There's only so many Tiffany dials versus non-Tiffany dials. And if you look at a lot of the auction results on some of the older pieces, the ones that say Tiffany, they have historically fetched a lot more money than its regular counterpart. So I don't think it's a bubble within the bubble. I think it's actually justified. And the explanation is really simple. It's supply and demand. A lot less Tiffany stamp paddocks out there than regular ones. And even in the dog models that I mentioned, right? Like the, some of the older annual calendars. Yeah, they don't fetch a whole lot of money, but if you take the regular version of that watch, it's going to probably trade at 
almost half price of that that's stamped with Tiffany, even though it's not a popular model. There's diehard collectors out there. All they want is Tiffany stamp paddock dolls. They have, and they have humongous collections that have gone up in value astronomically. So it's a pretty proven track record with Tiffany stamp dolls on paddocks. If you're looking to pay a premium for a Tiffany stamp paddock, I certainly suggest that you do because record shows they do tend to trade for a lot more than its regular counterparts. I'm gonna take one more from Christian Donov. Hi, Realm, I've been watching you since the beginning. Thank you so much. And I hear this a lot and I get emails and DMs on, on Instagram that, you know, guys that have been watching me since I had five subscribers, which really means a lot. That means I'm doing something right. You guys are sticking around, so thank you for that. I've uh, been watching you since the beginning. I'm interested in starting a watch business, but don't really know where to begin. I'm talking about reselling and collecting, and what can you say about Tag Heuer, and more specifically the Aqua Racer collection? Admiration for your work towards the watch community. Thank you. Uh, simple answer to you in regards to getting into the watch business. I get emails about people and wanting me to mentor them, and I get emails about people saying, how do you get started? What do you do? And I told you guys, I, I made a video how I got started. Uh, if somebody who's looking to enter the watch business today, it, it, it is so much easier than around the time that I did, because around the time that I did, selling expensive goods on the internet, especially via eBay, was very taboo. People were like, I'm not buying a $20,000 item from some guy in the basement based on just a few pictures. Who the hell is this guy? I don't know, he's not gonna take me for a ride and blah, 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 right? Today, it's so much easier because people are used to the fact that you can buy anything on the internet. People buy cars on the internet, they sometimes even buy houses on the internet and boats and so on and so forth, really high ticket items, because there is a lot more recourse if something goes wrong, but people still get screwed on the internet. There's plenty of fraud, don't get me wrong. I always tell people take safety precautions when shopping online. I don't have to deal with that problem anymore because we've been online for almost 17 years, but nevertheless today it's a lot easier to enter the industry. But at the same token, the industry is a lot more competitive. When I started this, it was me and a handful of guys online selling watches. Today there's thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of watches online that everybody and their mother is selling, starting from third party platforms that are not selling their own stuff flashlights and so on and so forth. Now we sell in all those places, Rule of Law, Gilt, uh, Amazon, StockX, eBay, Overstock, all those places we sell our watches on there just the same. So that, that obviously is gonna make your life a little bit harder because now the, the, you're competing and you're competing against a whole lot of people plus some big time companies. And when StockX got into selling watches, I was like, what are they doing? Why not? They took a small chunk of a pretty big pie that's out there right now we call the watch business. But the, I'll give you one advice in regards to getting starters and that is the, depending on where you live, Go to trade shows. Open up your own company, come up with a name, let's call it the uh, Christian Don of Watches, right? And uh, create all the necessary social media accounts to go along with it, website and so on and so forth. Make sure everything is in place. Make sure you're contactable so people can actually call you and speak with you. And then go to a watch trade show. And don't go in there and start buying stuff, especially if you don't know. The internet is a great source of information in terms of pricing and so on and so forth. But a lot of the prices have inflated, and I talked about this before. The reason they're inflated because nine out of 10 guys out there today sell pictures that don't have the physical watches because they have the ability to pick up the phone, call 20 deals, get on the chat group, find something, and all of a sudden, boom, they can deliver a particular watch to a client. And the prices tend to get driven up by that. To make themselves look better, they'll, they'll post a gazillion different watches online that they don't have in order to make themselves look a little more legit, a little more better or bigger than they really are. Something that I did in the very beginning I told you guys before, my website, I used to have nothing but full catalogs of watches that I didn't have. But again, nothing wrong with that uh, business model except the margins are not there. And with today's competition, you cannot get far on that business model, let me tell you firsthand, I know. So go to a trade show, walk around, ask questions, ask prices, ask, ask questions, questions, ask, ask prices, prices, ask, ask questions, questions, ask prices. prices. That's all you have to do. And take that information and compare it to what's going on online. Because oftentimes, just because you go to a trade show, sometimes dealers give me prices that are higher than uh, some people sell it on the internet. The line between wholesale and retail is slowly disappearing. It's slowly disappearing because everything is so transparent. Everybody knows retail prices, everybody knows what dealer discounts are on particular brands, how much you can get it for. So it's becoming very difficult to make money on regular goods. Once you take in a bunch of that information, attend a few trade shows, start buying. Start buying a few pieces, and first and foremost, before you start buying, figure out a way where it is are you going to sell those watches? Are you gonna grow an Instagram crowd? Are you, gonna, are you gonna build a website and drive traffic to your website? Are you gonna attend other trade shows and sell strictly wholesale by making smaller margins but flipping over more watches? That's the decisions you can make once you get a wealth of information. And like any other business, information is key. If you don't know, you won't be successful. Knowledge has always been the key for me and many other successful dealers. So I hope that little bit of advice helps you and perhaps I'll see you at one of the next trade shows. Well guys, that's it for me for today. I appreciate all the questions as usual. Comment below with the questions. I'll do my best to try and get to them. Like, share, subscribe if you're not subscribed, and I'll see you guys next Tuesday.